Hello there guys, welcome to Yosakura. This is a crash course video in which I'll show you how to create 3D composites inside Nuke. So to begin with, I'm going to show you different settings involved when you're working within 3D environment in Nuke and then I'm going to introduce you to the different nodes involved when setting up a complete 3D scene. Once you're familiar with creating a 3D scene, I'll show you how to render it out as a 3D output and then in the end I'm going to show you how to create this output. Last thing to note before I get started, this video is about creating 3D scenes and 3D composites. It's not about creating stereoscopic outputs. So uh, for those of you who are interested in that, I'll be creating a video later on, whereas this is definitely not it. So with that, let me just get started with the 3D settings involved while working in Nuke. To begin with, let me show you how to navigate in 3D within the viewer. So once you have a viewer created, by default you are working in the 2D viewport, whereas to work with 3D, we'll just come over here and shift it to 3D. To toggle between 2D and 3D, you can use a shortcut of pressing the tab key on your keyboard to shift between them. Now, as you can see, it didn't really change a lot. It just changed a little bit about the, uh, how exactly it was fit into the viewport. And apart from that, the only other change you can see is that there is a 3D axis down at the bottom left corner of the viewport now. By pressing the tab again, I come back to 2D and by pressing the tab again, I'm back in 3D. So this is the only difference which is occurring right now. Whereas there is no actual element in here which makes it look like it's in 3D. So the first shortcut I'm going to show you is how to zoom back with your camera. So here I'm going to just use my scroll, mo scroll wheel and start zooming outward. By so once I've done that, you can see that there is a three-dimensional grid which is present here. But what I want to do is actually navigate around in this grid. So if I press Alt and my right mouse button, you can see I can orbit around in this view. So this is one uh, way of moving around in your 3D scene. So this is one of the most important things that you'll keep looking and doing because you have to look at your scene from different angles. So apart from this, you can hold your Alt and your Shift with your left mouse button to pan around. So this is moving the entire scene sideways or top to bottom. Now you already know the uh, middle mouse scroll to zoom in and out. So these are the three most important navigations which you'd use when working in 3D. For those of you who are coming in from a different package like let's say Maya Max. So for those of you you can go into edit preferences and go into the viewer preferences here at the top. So uh, when using viewer preferences, you can see the 3D control type is by default set to Nuke. This is the navigation which I just showed you. Whereas if you're familiar with other packages like Maya, Houdini or Lightwave, you can set it to the particular package and immediately the entire navigation scheme changes and you can use the similar navigation. Like I've just set it to Maya, so my Alt left click orbits around, middle click pans around and right click zooms in and out. So whichever one you are comfortable with, you can set it to that. Uh, I'm more comfortable with Maya and I don't want to relearn the different navigation systems for each software. So this is much more useful for that. So this is how to navigate around in your 3D view. There are other settings as you can see when we come into 3D. So we have the 3D background and foreground which is set. So if you are not familiar, not comfortable with the black background, you can change that one here. So uh, apart from this, the last 3D setting you have to complete will be in the viewer itself. As you know, we can come to the node graph and pressing yes on the node graph opens up the settings for the project. Whereas if you press the S while you are on the viewport, you open the viewer settings and in viewer settings, you have a 3D setting tab completely set. And here you can set in all the options which you want uh, for this 3D uh, setup. The default settings here are perfect. You don't actually have to edit anything at all. Whereas one thing you might want to turn on is headlamp if you have um, uh, 3D objects and you have to navigate around and they're like dark and things like that. For people who are coming in from XSI, they'll be more familiar with this. So this is how to navigate around. Let's see how exactly you can work with 3D nodes next. Before I actually show you how to create 3D nodes inside Nuke, let me give you a brief presentation which is going to demo how a 3D scene in Nuke can be constructed, the different elements involved and how to render it out. A scene within Nuke is nothing but a collection of objects that have to be rendered out together. So for example, let us consider a tabletop with a lot of pens and pencils, books and whatnot. So, 
If these are different 3D objects that I want to be rendered at the same time, then these form the parts of my scene, elements in my scene. So let us have two elements in the scene, 3D object 1 and 3D object 2. And now I want to render these two elements out. Now, in our tabletop scene, let's just consider this to be one to be a pen and another to be, let's say, a book. So once we have these elements, what we want to do is actually render them out. So inside Nuke, we have a special node which is going to take this 3D scene and render it out as a sequence of images. So that node is known as the 3D renderer or the scanline renderer. So we connect these 3D objects to the scene which are then become a part of that scene and then it's rendered out. But there is a problem now. The problem is I don't know which angle the scene has to be rendered out from, meaning the computer does not know this. So because of which it'll just give you a blank slate. Let's say I want the computer to render the scene from the top view or the front view or the side. If I know this then I can create a camera which is going to represent the three-dimensional coordinates for the rendering. Once I have a camera set up, I can connect that to my renderer so that my scene is being rendered through that camera. So this is the most simplest setup which we can have inside Nuke for a 3D scene. Now, to take this one step further, because it is a 3D scene, one element which is missing here is lights. The reason we want lights in a 3D scene is because a 3D object looks three-dimensional not only because of the perspective but also because of the three-dimensional shading which it gets because when a light falls on an object it gives you the shading. So because of this the object looks three-dimensional and that is what we are trying to replicate. So because of this I want the scene to be lit. So I can create a light and connect it to my scene so all the objects immediately start interacting with the light. Now, this is the most default scene which can be present with all the elements involved. So we have objects, lights, cameras involved in one single scene inside Nuke. So let's get into Nuke and create a simple scene like this and then I'll come back to the presentation and continue along. All the nodes involved in creating a 3D scene within Nuke can be found under the 3D menu. And one thing to note, all the 3D nodes are always circular or capsule shaped. So it's easy to differentiate them from other nodes. So here let me start by creating a scene. So this is my three dimensional scene. As you can see it's circular in shape and I'll connect it to my viewer and you can see immediately a grid is visible. So also my viewport is shifted to 3D. Now once it is connected let me start by creating a simple object. So I'll first uh, create a simple tabletop as I was talking about. I'll create a simple desk. So for that I'm going to take a cube and a cube is created and I can navigate around and see this. Now one thing to note here, even though I'm looking at this scene, as you can see here the input is set to scene, I'm able to look at the cube only because the properties of the cube is open in the properties panel. This is something you have to take care of because when I close the properties for the cube, you can see it's invisible. If you want it visible in the scene, you have to connect it to the scene. Without it being connected, it will not be visible. So just make sure that the properties panel even if it em if it is empty you can see your objects or else there is some problem and you have to correct it now once i have created the cube i need to change some values so that i can actually go about and start editing this so with the cube selected i already have my transforms on the cube visible so as you can see there are these dots which i can pull about to scale the cube or I can use a gizmo in the center to move the cube or if I hold my control key I can see there is a new new gizmo uh, it's kind of hard to see but it, uh, there are these circles around the arrows the axis through which I can rotate my cube so this is the way I can start transforming the cube within the viewport or the easier method is to actually use the uh, properties for the cube itself to start doing these so to start with I'm going to start by setting up the cube height to be a lower value so I'm setting the top part of the cube to a low value on Y. Next, instead of going to the bottom, I can actually edit the value here itself. I can select some value. I can s use my scroll mouse or uh, scroll wheel on the mouse to actually lower or increase the value. So I've set this bottom uh, part of the cube to be on the grid and the top part of the grid to be 0.2, let's say 0.25 units high. So I have this set up and this is going to be my table top. 
now once I have a tabletop set up uh, let's say I wanted to create a simple book on top of this table so to create the book I'm going to create a new cube so I can go under geometry cube and this cube goes into the same scene remember that if it's not connected into the scene it's not part of the scene so once it's connected to the scene what I'm going to do is keep it on the tabletop so I'll start by decreasing its size interactively I'm just going to make sure the value for y here is 0 0.025 just the same as the height of the table so that it's exactly touching the bottom of the table so once that is set I can also move the entire object by using the translate values used here so I'm going to move the object in uh, x-axis okay sorry about that it went a bit too far so I can scroll with the mouse so that I can move the object anywhere I want. I can use the Z axis to position the object somewhere near the center and I'm going to rotate it on Y axis to give it some uh, let's just say to give it some randomness. So this is my book which is kept on the table. So as you can see it was very easy to set this thing up but once it is set up we have to render it and before we render we need a camera. So to set the camera I can come to the same 3D drop down and I have a simple cam I can open that up and as you can see again it's a circular node and even the objects are rectangular capsulated nodes rounded edges now using the camera I can go ahead set the translate rotate values till I get it to an exact uh, position I want I'm just going to move the camera back and up and I'm going to rotate it downwards so that it's looking at the table itself so now I have the camera looking at the table if you want to look through any light or objects which are there in the scene you can go to the drop down list and select the object that you want or by default only lights and cameras can be looked through no not objects like you can do in Maya so if I select camera here you can see that this is the actual uh, object or this is what I'm looking at so if I start navigating away you can see that I'm out of the camera now if I want to be always locked I can turn on the lock so it's always locked to the cam also another thing you have to note here is that once it's uh, locked the camera is locked you can no longer navigate in 3d It's just a two-dimensional panning that you have now so once your camera is set make sure it doesn't really matter if your camera is not connected into the scene because it will not be used uh, you have to make sure that your camera is connected to the rendering so once I have my two cubes and my scene set up I'm going to connect this camera into my renderer the renderer is also available in the 3d drop down it is the last node uh, which you get so this is a scanline rendering I'll take this and this node has specific inputs as you can see here so the different inputs you have is the camera object which you need to connect to the camera so I'll connect this to the camera next you have the object or the scene so it's not always that you need a complete scene to create a rendering you can also render directly using an object and the camera if it's a single object but since we have two we are going to connect it to my scene so once it's connected this uh, rendering is set up but let's just say uh, that you want to use a background element I'll talk about a background element in a second so uh, the background element basically means uh, this empty region which you have uh, in and around the actual table itself this alpha region if you want any kind of image to be put into that background uh, region you can connect it to the background node we'll be using it later on when we do the composite for the earth and all that so I'll connect it to my viewer but by, as you can see there is nothing which has changed the reason for that is because we are still in 3d view I'll change it back to 2d and immediately this is what you get there is absolutely nothing the reason there is nothing is because there is no light everything is basically blank so I need to create a light in my scene so that I can see what's happening so I'll uh, keep it exactly the way I had kept it in my presentation so that you can understand it so I'm going to start by creating a light I can go into my 3d drop down I have different lights I'm going to use a direct light so that it's easier to see what's happening so once a direct light is created I'll, I'm going to connect it into my scene itself 
now once it's connected let me go back into my 3d view and see what's happening I'll turn off the camera lock and now if I move around you can press F on your keyboard if you want to zoom into something specific so as you can see the direct light is actually sitting inside the cube itself that is not the issue the issue is that anytime you're lighting the scene it has to come in from an angle especially when you're lighting something like a cube so that you get more of a variation so for this I'm going to press control just rotate it a little bit so that there is some three-dimensional variation in the lighting so well, let's just say I keep it as such almost similar to the camera but not exactly okay so what you have is this 3D look which you're getting now just because of lighting it I'll come back to my default node so here what I now have is a complete blank canvas and as you can see if I move my mouse around you can see that there is no actual color value which is coming in the reason for that is because these are definitely 3d objects but they actually have no color which is being put into them so just to get some variations I'm going to go ahead create a checkerboard and just directly plug it into the image uh, inputs for the cubes I'm going to explain why exactly these image inputs are there later on but for now let, let me just connect them now once it's connected you can see that there is some color input which is coming in and the objects are being textured now uh, as you can see it's kind of dark the entire output is dark you can gamma it up so you can see better what's exactly happening but easier way to get this done is uh, actually to increase the intensity of your direct light so by default it's at 1 let me increase it to 10 so this is my t three dimensional lighting which has just happened now as you can see it doesn't really look completely 3d it's kind of really still just flat so to make it look a bit more 3d let me just take a spear so I'll just create a spear in this I connect it into my same scene and I'll connect it to my checkerboard now once it's connected uh, of course the spear is too large I'm just going to tab out of this I'm going to come out and I'm going to reduce the size so as you can see just because there is a light in the scene you can see that spear looks three-dimensional if I disable the light you can see it's completely flat of course because of the movement it looks 3d but it no, no longer has a three-dimensional shading on it so that is the benefit of having a light I'll just go ahead reduce the radius for this and after that I'm going to take this spear and I'm going to keep it on top of the table so all I need to do is take this radius add it on top of the value of the table so it's exactly sitting on top I'll move it off to the side so now I have a spear a book and the tabletop now all of these are connected to the checkerboard we can change the image later on so I'm not going to edit that I'm going to go tab out of the 3d view back into 2d and this is what we have as you can see we have the tabletop we have a uh, object representing the book and we have the object representing the spear the best part about this is that because it's completely 3d within nuke itself whatever resolution you have set for your final rendering that is the resolution that you get your output at and it's all automatically anti-aliased at that level so there's the easiest and the best way of getting some outputs now I'm going to go ahead and just add in a couple of elements into the scene so that uh, I get more variety so for that let me just tab out I'll pause the video and get back in a second okay so what I've done is I've actually gone ahead I googled for a couple of images and I have uh, taken in this one image about uh, of a wood texture which is already lit uh, and then I also have this uh, one stock image by uh, this person called JQX he's from DeviantArt I got it um, got this leather pack from him so I have two images which I'm going to add in to my different cubes to get some details so let's just get back into the 3d view and see what exactly I'm doing so first to begin with as we already know uh, this first cube is the tabletop so I'm going to disconnect it from the checkerboard and I'm going to connect it to the table the wood texture that I have and as you can see immediately it looks like a wood which is being a wooden table which is being lit now apart from this I'm going to take the other image uh, input for the second cube which I have which is the book and connect it to the leather and as you can see there is immediately some leather detail which is being added in on top so as easy as that 
but as you can see it's not really that three-dimensional the lighting's not set perfectly so I'm just going to delete this PO because it was just put in for showing you the benefits of lighting I'm going to shift into my 3d view and now I'm going to change the light so that I have a bit more of a shading effect so that I can differentiate between the table and the book easily so I'm just shifting the light this side so I can see it better holding control and rotating it so it's a bit more on the side I also take the book I make sure I open its properties so that uh, I can easily rotate it over here okay just rotating the book a little bit I'm going to move it the pivot point of the book is changed because the uh, why I didn't move the object in the world coordinate system I actually change the properties of the cube itself uh, it's up to you whichever one you find easier you can use such methods to manipulate objects but make sure you do it in the end you know what exactly you're doing so as you can see here I have a wooden table and on top of which I have this actually a block of leather but uh, you can just uh, put up a different texture on the sides and such and get a proper output so this is as easy as that to create this 3D output from Nuke itself. Now, the things involved while creating this were first, I created different objects, 3D objects, which were involved in a particular scene. I put lights in the scene so that the object gets shading. And then I created a camera for the view which I want to render. So the entire scene is being rendered from this view. And then everything is being put into this camera for rendering. Now, if I shift back, I'll just show you what exactly this background node does, this BG node. I connect it to my leather pack and immediately you'll see that the background is shifted to the leather texture. Now one thing you would have observed is that the resolution of the image changed as soon as it's being rendered. That is because anytime you connect a background node to anything at all in Nuke, the background represents the size of the output. So if this background image is really large, then the background is going to be large, whereas if it's small, the background is small. Simple as that. So you can override different settings. So as you can see, the entire output quality is a bit low now because this is the resolution we are at. Now, this is a simple scene which we set up. Now let me go ahead and uh, continue along with the presentation. I'll talk a little bit more about creating textures and modifying these objects which you create. So till now you already know how to create different 3D objects and I've also shown you how to take simple images, apply them before the object so that they are used as textures. The next step is uh, I'll show you how you can apply modifiers or modify different attributes of your object like moving it or changing the shape. So these modifiers are applied after your 3D object and once you're satisfied with the modifications you have done you can connect them into your scene. So now let me shift over to Nuke and I'll show you a few of the main modifiers that you'll be using. So I have just set up this very simple scene here. So as you can see, the scene contains two different objects with a single texture applied to them, a default checkerboard and a light and a camera in the same scene. So now let me just space out of this. Uh, so this is the final uh, render that we have from the scene. I'll just tab out of this to go into the 3D view so you can see what exactly is happening. So I have two different objects. One is a card and one is a cube. Both have been transformed and rotated so the default values no longer apply. Only the cube, uh, sorry, only the plane is sitting at the origin whereas it's rotated but uh, the cube has both been rotated and moved. So now uh, once we have applied some transforms, let's say you want to lay the transforms, you want to add in another set of transforms on top of this or basically move the object. So there is a speci special node which is going to allow or help you move an object. That node uh, can be found under modify and that is a transform geo. So if I apply transform geo, you can see that it has uh, very specific inputs. The default one without any naming on it is the input. Uh, um, this is where you input your geometry or objects which you want get which you want transformed. Apart from this, we have the axis and the look. I'm going to talk about these in a little while. So let me just disconnect the cube from the scene itself. I'll connect the cube into my transform geo and connect the transform geo into my scene. So now that it is connected, you can see that the transform geo has just given me these handles. Uh, this is just like the origin handles or the transform handles that I had for the cube itself. And I can rotate, I can scale, I can do all the operations using this transform geo. Now the reason that this is useful is that 
now I can have uh, different uh, values for the cube itself so for example I can rotate the cube however I want I can position the cube as an uh, individual value I can position it wherever I want and then apply transform geo which is like a clean slate it gives me pure zero values like I'm transforming the object itself from the origin again so as you can see the default cubes uh, origin or the pivot point is in the center whereas the transform geo is at the origin itself so this is one way of moving an object now let's say you want to move these two objects the card and the cube at the same time whereas you don't want them combined you don't want these two objects merged so in such a case the transform geo can still be used the way you would use it this time is go into modify take a new transform geo up, uh, put it to this card and now we are going to make use of this axis uh, input which you have for this by default the first node that I have under 3D is the axis node so I'm going to take this node for those of you who don't actually know what the axis node is it is nothing but a simple uh, placeholder or a locator or a null object it basically does not get rendered but it stores translate rotate scale skew and pivot values which you can use for to create layer up your animations or move different objects so how exactly I'm going to use it is um, as you know the transform geo already has this axis uh, value present on it so I'm going to take this axis value from both the transform nodes and I'm going to connect it to the single one so now that it is connected I'll just come back here I'll double click on the axis node so I have the axis node properties are visible here now if I move the axis as you can see both the plane and the cube move together like as if they are single objects so this gives me a lot of control over different objects in a scene it's like uh, grouping them together so this way you can move different objects at the same time now uh, even though you have connected it like this you can still go back to the card itself you can still transform it individually or you can come back to the axis and transform them as a group so there is there are loads of options you can also apply several axis nodes on top of each other like I can take another axis node connect that to this and now I can go back to this axis node and move those so basically I'm like par parenting different objects on top of each other so that's very helpful it's like layering your transform operations so that is one thing so that was our uh, transform geo I'll uh, get back to what exactly this look operation is in uh, just a few seconds so as you've already seen I was uh, taking the plane and um, the plane was connected to the axis node and then I was able to uh, move both the cube and the ob uh, cube and the card using a single axis but we also have this uh, separate operation known as look in our node so the look node is basically similar to axis but instead of actually moving the object it lets the object stay in the same place but it makes the object look at the axis node or the node which is connected to look all the time so what I actually mean by that is let's say I connect this look node to my axis as you can see there is a sudden change uh, what it does is because this axis is being connected to the look value if I move this axis you can see the plane actually follows through it actually always tries to look at this axis so even though the plane stays in the same place the axis lets it look at them or it basically keeps pointing at the axis all the time so as you can see the cube which is connected to the axis uh, the axis which is connected to the input here on the transform geo for the cube lets it move whereas a card geometry actually lets it rotate or always look at the node itself so this is a very easy way of uh, creating simple rigs within Nuke I'll actually be using this when I'll show you how to create stereoscopic rigs uh, it's a much easier way than actually scripting it in so till then uh, just try to go through the video again so that you understand what exactly is happening I will not be using this uh, method for creating the earth uh, composite I'll be just uh, compositing it by default without any kind of transform geos or anything like that applied so now next node which I want to show you is the merge geometry node so as you can see uh, the cube node and the card node are being applied into the scene or uh, put into the scene as separate geometries whereas let's say you wanted to merge them together have them as single objects so in such a case you can use merge geometry to do that I'll just connect merge uh, inputs to the cube and also 
the card to the merge geometry input now once it's connected I can disconnect the card and the cube I'll connect just the merge geo into my scene and once it's connected you can see both these objects have come into the scene as a single object single entity as you can see merge geometry does not have a lot of options so let's say if I wanted to transform this merge geo I can just directly apply a transform geo to this and now by moving it I'm moving both the objects as if they are one so previously I had to apply transform geo to both of them separately this time I'm applying only a single transform to move both of them so there are different ways of doing the same operations just make sure you do the whatever you think or will work out the best now merge geometry is basically something like um, grouping or combining objects like what you have in Maya, Max or Coral Draw. So this is a very simple operation. I'm not going to go too deep into it. Apart from merge geo, you have crosstalk geometry, you have lookup, log geo and um, let's just say trilinear. All of these are basically like uh, lookup tables or curves which you have in Photoshop. They take the default values which are already present in the object and try to modify them. Uh, so let me just uh, try to open up something like um, lookup geometry. This is nothing but a simple lookup table. It has 0 to 1 values for all the axes and by changing these values for different axes you can change the shape of the objects. It has a lot of power but it's kind of hard to understand for beginners. So let me just try and uh, um, show this. So as you can see the cube which is present is present on my positive Z axis so I'll just go to my Z axis here and I'll tell I want the cube flattened to the origin so basically I want all the values taken here and I want them all flattened to zero so basically I'm taking all the values which are present and I'm taking them down to zero so basically I scaled down my entire cube and I made it flat so uh, as easy as that I was able to get in some values so there are loads of possibilities that you have while using this uh, for example I can actually make it uh, like a comet or a teardrop shape you can create like uh, raindrops if you have a spear using this so uh, try to experiment with this try to see exactly what it does it's uh, not really in scope for me to go into the details or show you what exactly can be done right now so the all the different ones which I just mentioned which is um, the lookup geometry log geo and um, also the crosstalk geometry does the same operations so just go through them now apart from that uh, the other thing I want to show you is uh, procedural noise this node basically adds in specific noise onto any object which you have so as you can see I just took the spear uh, it just took the cube and it uh, basically added a lot of noise onto it so it's uh, easy to create some additional values onto objects like this so I'll be creating an asteroid uh, using the moon texture in a little while for that now apart from this we also have radial distortion uh, this is a simple node it's very easy to understand uh, it's basically like a spherical distortion you can go ahead increase the value here so you can see what exactly it does uh, for objects which are at the center so let me just put this back at the center itself I can uh, go ahead take the distortion value and actually increase it to a high level and immediately you can see what exactly it's doing to the object sorry about that so as you can see it's adding this kind of a star shape it's uh, giving you the spherical distortion to the object so you can uh, use this to play around add in some extra quirks into your shape uh, also it goes into both positive and negative directions so as you can see it can create different kinds of interesting shapes for you so uh, that is a radial distortion next apart from this uh, the UV project is uh, something which I'll show you in a little while I'll uh, not use it for now this is basically used to project your textures onto different objects we'll actually create a landscape also in this uh, video so I'll be using UV project to create that so before that let me just show you displace geo which I just uh, missed so displace geo is a very uh, good node to use it uh, tries to uh, create some randomness or basically displaces objects depending on the node which you connect here to the display channel so let me just go ahead uh, I'll create a simple let's say a color bars node and I'll connect this to my displace and as you can see immediately it gives me some different results so basically what happened is the 
color bars value is going into the node I'll just connect the image from the cube into the color bar so you can see what's happening so you can see that all the values which are coming in especially the CMY values which are the brightness values are actually pulling the object out whereas all the RGB values are pushing the object in so this way you can like um, add in any kind of geometry details which you want like uh, a displacement map or a bump map so if I just go into my cube uh, as you can see the resolution is very low so because of which you are not able to get a lot of details so I can actually go ahead and increase the resolution here and because Nuke uh, doesn't really have to uh, like create a lot of details it does quite fast even uh, compared to this so as you can see there are lots of details here each one is stepped so it's creating different values so using this you can add in a lot of information into your geometry I'll also be using this uh, for creating some details into my composite so those were the main modifiers I wanted to show you so these are the different modifiers which you'll be using most of the times now apart from the modifiers what I wanted to show you is the shaders so I'll just get back to you by creating a simple scene here just so you already know how to apply textures to 3D objects and modify them before putting them into your scene. So to apply any kind of shading nodes, they go right before the 3D object itself. So all of the properties or any now node involving diffuse, specular, emission properties or complete material, everything goes in right before the 3D object. So now before we actually start creating 3D shading, let me just give you a brief Photoshop demonstration about what exactly shading means and then we'll switch over to Nuke. Let's actually understand what exactly shading means within Photoshop itself. So to begin with, first I'm um, in Photoshop right now. I will just a simple blank document. What I'm going to start by doing is uh, creating a simple scene where I will show you how exactly or what exactly shading means. And once you understand that, I'm going to go ahead and um, uh, show it to you how, how to create the same things in Nuke. So to begin with, first I'm going to start by creating a simple circle. This is going to be my spear and uh, with this sphere I'm going to create a simple mask so that that is the uh, one for my layer for those of you who don't really know Photoshop uh, you don't have to worry about this because uh, you'll easily understand what I'm trying to do uh, it's not about the software so what I'm going to do is take a simple gradient tool so as you can see here I'm going to take a black and white gradient on a radial and um, with this mask selected I can just see what's happening there okay so I'm just going to fill this uh, so it's uh, filled in the reverse direction so let me just exchange the colors so reverse them and fill them so as you can see it immediately starts looking 3D the spear looks 3D the reason that the spear looks 3D is because of the shading what shading means is the way the lights changing on the surface the shades of the light or the color that it's providing so wherever the light is actually falling which is this bright region over here on the top this region is completely bright or white or that is the region where I can actually see the actual color of the object whereas where where the light does not reach the sh shaded region this is the region where we uh, get the shadows right now the reason the object looks 3D by default is because when an, a light falls it creates the shadows on the object when the shadow is created we or our mind is capable of analyzing how exactly the light is falling and if the light is falling in this direction and if the shadows are there our mind automatically tells us that okay the object is actually in 3D so that is what we are trying to fool our object or mind into thinking so all of that we think of all of that we uh, see as 3D is nothing but the shading or the changing values which we see here so now uh, if I want to create an object itself let's say I wanted a red object I wanted this object to be red completely so what I would do in such a situation is uh, I'll just go take this uh, simple one here I'll just make sure I have a black and white gradient here and now instead of the white color I'm going to shift it to red and now by filling in the sphere once more and just let's go reverse it again by filling it again with red you can see it's a red sphere this time the reason it's a red spear is because wherever the light is falling it's giving me the red color now as soon as you look at this it definitely does not look like as if it's shining now 
the reason objects shine is because they reflect when they reflect something the more they reflect the more sharper the reflections if uh, let's say you take a cloth for example if you see the reflections on a cloth you can't really see or apply makeup looking at a cloth can you so similarly if you go to a mirror the reflections are so sharp that the contrast or the, there is a sudden variation between the dark and the light tones so that is what makes an object look reflective so let's add in a reflection on top of this what I'm going to do is take the same layer I'm going to, I'm going to duplicate this I'm going to remove the fill which is present within this layer uh, just making sure it is blank now I'm going to take a default black and white gradient and fill that on top so let me just go create a small black and white gradient on top now because uh, for those of you who are not understanding what I'm going to do next I'm just applying a simple operation here called screen so basically what it does is remove all the black and only leave the white values so now as soon as I do that you can see that the object starts looking a little bit shiny right so I can just place the object a little bit precisely so you can see that the object starts looking a bit shiny but it's not uh, exactly that shiny to begin with so to make it look more shiny I can actually go ahead and start creating some values or basically I can start editing it a little bit so what I'll do is I'll go into adjustments I'll go into my curves and start editing this I'll just make it a bit more sharper so I'll make sure my black is gone and my white is gone really sharp so as you can see the there is a sudden change this time from white to red so that sudden change is what is going to make the object look more glossy or that is what is going to make the object look more reflective so as you can see just in Photoshop just by taking a simple red spear we are able to add in some shadows we are able to add in some light so this is all it takes to create some objects or basically to create something which uh, looks three-dimensional just uh, you need the proper shading on top of it so we are trying to create the same thing with a nuke so let's get into nuke I've created a simple scene I'll show you what I've done and exactly how to get something similar as you can see what I have here is very similar to what I had created in Photoshop only that there is a um, actual texture in the diffuse itself now the network which is there for this image is very simple so as you can see there is a simple diffuse shader and then there is a specular shader uh, which is uh, applied to the sphere and both of them have certain maps applied to them and by just using diff uh, simple diffuse and specular you can pretty much cre create any kind of material you want so I'll concentrate more on these two materials themselves so I have a simple scene set up here again so this scene has only a spear and uh, light in the entire scene so let me start by creating a simple checkerboard I apply that as a texture to the spear and connect it to my viewer so as you can see I have a simple spear with the uh, checkerboard texture applied to it and the light is falling on it and by default nuke already has diffuse shading applied on top of the spear now to start shading this what I have to do is uh, just on the 3d drop down shader I just had to uh, check the nodes which I want to get the particular output now by default diffuse is the first thing you would have to pick because that is going to give you the default um, lighting or how exactly the light is supposed to behave on your object itself so now I've applied diffuse and as you can see it doesn't exactly look as good there is some shading going on but uh, it looks uh, mostly flat for uh, most of it so for that the reason for that is um, diffuse uh, or any other node which you take from shader uh, already has two nodes or two inputs which are coming into them one is called the map and another is a default input when you are connecting this checkerboard this is supposed to be your map this is supposed to go into your diffuse properties map so therefore it's actually connected to the wrong map here so what I'm going to do is just disconnect it from the default view and put it into the map and as you can see immediately I have a different uh, looking output it looks similar to what I had before when the diffuse was not at all connected so this is one output which I'm getting now now the I have the diffuse which is coming in but as you can see it's really dark it's uh, really not that bright the reason for this is as you can see in the diffuse properties here on the side let me just open it individually so as you can see the white point is set to 0.18 because of which the brightest region will be darkened down to this level you can take it down if you want it darker or you can take it up if you want it brighter because I want one to be perfectly one in the final output I'm going to just go 
put it in to value of 1 so that I know whatever color I put in will be the exact color which comes out so now that I have this output created what I'm going to do next is apply some specular highlight on top of this now I'll just take my diffuse take it up just to organize things a bit better I'll just put the map on the side next uh, node I want to apply is the specular I'll just take in the specular as you can see specular also has certain maps which can be connected to it so it has a map as such and then a simple map and then it has the same default input now when we are going to connect the specular into this node pipe we should make sure that it's the uh, unnamed input the default input which is being connected from diffuse be because we want specular to shade uh, whatever output is coming in from the diffuse and not actually use diffuse itself as a map so therefore I'll just put in the specular and as you can see this is the default way it got connected and if you observe it also has a specular highlight I can just go ahead increase the highlight brightness and you can see that the highlight increases I'll just keep it to 1 so that is just a default uh, value but you have to remember that um, whatever specular you are applying is being screened on top of the diffuse itself so now if I go to the highlight itself and place my mouse on top you can see that the value here for the white point is much greater it's more than 1 you can also see it's out of gamut so I can take this down if I want so that it's not actually out of gamut but it doesn't really matter for this because it definitely uh, most of the time specular highlights or reflections are out of gamut when the light is falling on them so it's better to have them as such so now I have a simple spear I have uh, some kind of uh, specular highlight also applied on top so now this is a very simple material I have created now let's just say that instead of this checkerboard uh, having this um, uh, now the spear being this uh, checkerboard texture I want it to be that same red color I can just go back to my checkerboard start changing the colors here and as you can see immediately the changes are almost real time not exactly real time but almost real time and you can still see the effect is being carried across next the next step is uh, the specular highlight itself which is going to give you most of the properties of the material like uh, or you can see if I just uh, go ahead disable the specular you can see the object looks like it's matte or like it's not reflective it looks like it's made of rubber or maybe paper or something which is not reflective whereas when I turn on the specular it starts looking shinier so therefore uh, you well, whatever material you're trying to get you're supposed to apply get a proper specular highlight on that to get the pro best output so the three properties you want to change include the white and both the minimum and maximum shine by default the minimum and maximum shine work together so therefore if I go ahead change the minimum shine to let's say zero you can see that it did change but it's not a lot whereas I can take the maximum shine and let's say go up to a hundred and you can see this sh highlight becomes sharper so as I was telling in Photoshop the simple demo that I gave the sharper the highlights the more reflective or more glossy the surface looks so you can actually take this to a greater number and therefore you'll have a much sharper highlight but as you can see the highlight is too small and it's not visible so now I can actually take the white point and increase it so I can actually see the highlight itself so there's a very glossy spear but uh, because the highlight is too small you can't actually see it this time so therefore try to have a balance between the highlight white point and actually the uh, minimum and maximum shininess so I can actually make uh, see the highlight itself now we have this uh, next step is to actually go ahead and uh, shade the object so that the highlight is being used properly so as you can see here the surface wherever it has a lighter color has more of the specular highlight whereas the surface which is darker in color is eating into the specular highlight itself so this is uh, something which you can actually map in so what I'm going to do is take in a simple noise I'll take a constant I'll apply noise to this constant so it's a simple noise I'll just look through it so you can see this is a very simple noise which I'm getting and I want the spear to have specular highlight being modified as such so I'll just come back and look at the final output which I have here okay so what I'll do is take my specular map shading I'll just connect it to my noise 
and immediately you cannot really observe any difference there the reason for that being the map message uh, property is actually taking in the minimum shine and the maximum shine values and uh, merging those together while creating this uh, to show you the effect I'll just take the white point for the specular shading back to 1 and take the minimum shine let's say down to 50 so that the minimum shine is larger so let's just uh, make it uh, a bit more larger let's say 0 itself so as you can see the specular highlight now starts to show some noise right so there is some kind of a variation in the specular noise itself so this is the kind of effect you would usually want to have of course not so harsh um, the reason for that being no natural object is perfectly uh, shiny there is always some kind of variation within it so this mapping kind of tries to exploit that so by just creating a simple noise map I was able to take you know, make use of it so now this is the noise map which I actually have and I actually can go ahead and start editing this I can make the frequency lesser and now if I shift over to my final view you can see the specular also started changing I can go ahead okay this is too high okay so as you can see the specular highlight also has the same kind of texture applied so I'm being able to actually manipulate the specular highlight individually also instead of just connecting it to map as such I can also connect it to map itself for specular highlight and as you can see it's affecting the overall specular not just the minimum and maximum shine this time so if you want to uh, affect the overall uh, property of a shading node connected to map if you have a map as such or any other node it probably involves manipulating one of the other properties so now I have a simple uh, property being manipulated I can actually go ahead connect it back to SH so I have this back again and also this is uh, pretty much the entire sphere which I wanted to show you how to create now apart from this as you can see this region the region which is completely dark is per perfectly pitch black as you can see it has absolutely no values other than alpha so therefore if I need to have in some have some values or certain values even in this region the way I can start getting that is by applying an emission node so in shader we have something called emission so this emission is basically something like self illumination so using this I can make sure the object is not completely dark it has some values so I'll just connect the emission after the my specular and as you can see the object so immediately starts looking like it's translucent that is because the emission property is making sure the object has a minimum of this value or minimum value of 0.18 so therefore all the blacks are being taken up to this value let's just say I don't want it to be so uh, dark or light whatever it is I can take it I can put in let's say 0.1 and immediately that value is considered of course I can also connect it to any map I have so that the emission is actually taking that into consideration so as you can see the emission property is affecting both the uh, region which has uh, shading on it and also the region which has a shadow on it we'll be making use of the emission map in the earth composite so that we can get some city lights in the background so now you already have seen how to take these different nodes and connect them together now let's actually see how to create some complex materials so we have one one um system or one uh, set of material which I have created where actually a checkerboard is a diffuse texture and we have some uh, no noise in the specular highlight and also in the emission properties now I'm going to go ahead and create a new shading network so this time I'm taking a simple diffuse and I'll apply let's just say I'll just take in the noise from here I'll just uh, start adding let's just say simple specular on top of this so as you can see I have a diffuse created with the map from here the noise map and then I have a specular map created from here I'll just keep this in the center so it's easier to understand where all it's being used okay so as you can see it's a very useful uh, way to create different uh, materials out of the same maps so now that I have a material created I want it applied but I want it to apl be applied to the same sphere but as you can see if I take the specular output and I connect it to my sphere immediately it uh, gets disconnected from the emission properties and it's connected only to the specular itself but I want it to be connected to both the emission and the specular so to merge them together what I actually have is if I go under the shader I have a merge material which is exactly the same as merging your different layers so if I take this you can see it has a A and B channel 
and I can connect one to A and another to B and give the output to my spear. So as you can see I'm actually taking in two different outputs and combining them together. So I can actually go ahead change the operation which I want let's say plus so both the materials are being added on top of each other so as you can see it given a lot of these specs on top instead I can even go uh, use anything like replace where one material is replacing another so as such you can actually go ahead merge different materials together and create new materials of your own so this is a very useful note to have and I will be making use of this while creating the earth composite so for now the main things that you have learned till now is uh, includes how exactly you can apply textures to your nodes so that you can create something simple like this so uh, I created a simple tabletop and a leather texture on sitting on top of it and then I'd shown you how exactly you can apply some uh, create two or more objects apply transforms together create some modifiers on top of them etc uh, and then i would shown you what kind of output can be created just by applying some shaders so now you pretty much know most of the things involved in creating 3d composites so now let me go ahead and create a few more composites so that you get a complete uh, grip on the concept of 3d compositing within nuke so to get started with there are several things I want to do so most of the thing that I'm going to show you include the things which I've already shown but in different contexts so that you understand things in a more intuitive manner so let's just get started by creating simple composites so in the previous section I've already shown you how to create the simple composite for this we had two different cubes with uh, specific images coming into each one of them a single light and a camera in the scene and then we had this output but of course this output doesn't really look that good uh, the same texture on the top of this slab is applied to all, all the sides and therefore you can see that the side is really not that good uh, and also the table top itself is kind of flat shaded the lighting which you are seeing is actually there in the image itself and also one thing you'll notice that there is no shadow of the book cast on the table itself it looks like as if the book is floating on top so what we are going to try and create is this where you can see that there is a loads of texture on the object itself there is certain textures on the sides and also as you can see at the bottom let me just refresh once so as you can see on the sides there are these uh, um, textures applied so it looks like there's some pages coming in uh, across it also there are shadows and also some ambient occlusion uh, which is being faked and uh, the lighting is being removed from the side so it looks like it's actually some planks which are coming inside so the network we have for this includes something like this so as you can see this is for the tabletop itself so this was the one we had previously and what we have now includes this so as you can see this is the tabletop we had this entire uh, network related to that and then we have this network which is related to the book itself so there are loads of things happening here so before we get started by cre with creating this composite let me show you how to create projections within Nuke and then uh, go about and show you how exactly you can create this entire output so with a nuke there are two ways that you can actually work with projection the first is uh, manipulating the texture which is being applied on the object or in another way you can actually manipulate the UVs itself on the object the first method uh, which is uh, applying the texture using projections is what I'm showing you right now so to do this we can go under shader and here we have project 3d node and this node is going to help us create projections using simple textures onto objects so the first projection texture I'm just applying it just before the image is connected to the card itself so as you can see there is a sudden change which uh, just occurred now what I what this projection does is it gives you a camera input so wherever this camera is present or wherever I connect the camera from that is where the image gets projected from so I'll just create a simple cam uh, let's just say I connected to this so as you can see immediately the whole output went blank the reason for that being in my 3d in uh, 3d view as you can see the camera is sitting exactly at the origin so what I'll do is take the camera and move it to the back so immediately it'll start observing that the camera itself is creating the projection one thing to note here the object which I'm using is not exactly the same resolution as my project settings which is 2k uh, 35 mm so for that reason I can apply a th reformat node onto this and immediately I'll set it to fill so you can see that uh, the object is filling exactly the corner points of my camera 
where the camera points are intersecting with the plane so now if I want to let's say uh, have the object projected from some other angle all I need to do is take the camera move it wherever I want and the texture follows not only this even when the camera is rotated you can see that there is perspective distortion being added on the texture and the best part about it when you're rendering out your final scene you're no longer using the same camera which you use for texturing which is over here you're using a separate shot cam because of which the texture appears distorted or you could distort the texture beforehand so that it appears undistorted here so this is a very simple way of uh, applying projections so here what we have done is taken a texture forget the reformat here this is a uh, entire thing is just the texture we are using this camera to project the texture onto this object very simple process so next step I'll show you how exactly you can apply multiple textures and merge them together using the same method so let's just say that you already have this texture applied but what you actually wanted is um, this wood texture being applied to the entire plane itself so therefore it has to be like this but uh, let's say you wanted to add in some other detail on top of this texture itself which is a projection like for example the shadow of the book which I want I wanted to add it on top so for such things what we can do is actually merge materials once we project them so let me just go ahead disconnect these nodes and I'll re-enable this let me take a checkerboard and connect that in as my default texture so this is the actual texture which is being projected onto the plane this time but what I want is the wherever I don't have the uh, checkerboard texture I wanted to have the actual plane plank texture itself so for this purpose what I can do is go ahead I can take under the shader I have merge material and this merge material gives us some ba very basic mathematical operations like subtraction addition or basically you can use it as max min um, you'll have to plan this out beforehand uh, about how to use it let's uh, let's say you are going to use shadows in such a case you can um, you can use it to minimum so that shadows are being added it acts kind of like multiply not exactly so you'll have to test it out now what I'm going to do is uh, connect it to both of these textures and just uh, exchange them so that this uh, wood is my actual background node which is coming in and then I'll set it to minimum or let's just say plus so that I can see both of them at the same time and connect the texture from the card to the merged material so as you can see immediately I have my original uh, node or my original texture for the plane itself and then I have this projected texture which is being shown so if I come into the 3D scene I can take the 3D cam I can actually move it around and you'll see that the 3D texture action the projected texture star actually starts being updated so I can easily add in different textures layered on top of each other projected from different angles and merge them together so if you have like let's say two different textures which you are adding in together and uh, whichever area which is an overlap uh, you can just set it to black and then set it to plus or ma maximum so that you get specific outputs you have different operations which you can use over here so as you can see by using the same method I've just used merge material so that I have a simple texture which is being applied to the UV coordinate and another texture which is actually being projected and then being applied to the card itself the last method which I'm showing you right now is going to affect the UV coordinates of the objects so all the textures which are applied to the objects which make use of the UVs will be affected so for example here if you observe uh, this texture which is applied to the object is not projected or there is no UV mapping or anything as such or any UV manipulation happening for this so th this texture will be affected whereas this project 3D node which is already applying some uh, coordinates onto this texture will not be affected so this is only um, going to affect those textures which don't have any kind of projection applied to them so the, with the project 2d node apply let me create a new camera for this I'll connect it to my axis and now as you can see immediately the checkerboard is still there but whereas the background map which you had uh, for the object itself is gone so now I can take the camera I can move it and you will see that the wooden texture is being manipulated uh, it's only in the viewport that you can observe that um, the texture the checker map is gone that is only a viewport display thing whereas you can move the object around here and you'll see that it's only the 
um, texture which is making use of the UV coordinates which is being manipulated over here so you can actually go ahead animate the camera you can do loads of things to get the final output that you're looking for so this is the last method which I wanted to show you the next thing which I'm going to show you is uh, how exactly I created this entire network and how I created this output so finally to show you what I have done to create this output uh, let me just play the video once so as you can see there's a three dimensional scene with a box at the bottom and a box at the top the one at the bottom is textured as it's a wooden plank and the one at the top is textured so it looks kind of like a book and the tabletop is also textured so that it looks like it has some kind of a shadow going on so now I'll show you how exactly this output was created to begin with, first let's uh, take a look at the wooden texture itself which I have here. So as you can see this is the default one which I had but then I took the same texture and I merged this ex additional no, texture on top of it. So this is nothing but a simple rotor paint which I've applied onto, onto the texture itself. So I took a simple constant and I applied a little bit of noise. Uh, the noise is not really visible here and um, once I applied the noise I then went up to the rotor paint I drew up a simple shape so you can see this is a very simple shape which I've drawn one which is giving me the very solid black color outline close to the object itself and then a very hazy outline which is going outwards so this is going to give me that uh, soft shadows which I had so now once this was created I went ahead and merged it together to create this output so there's basically the wooden texture with this multiplied on top so basically I'm adding shadows so once this is done I had to connect them to the cube itself so this is what I created so this is what I had but the problem with this method is uh, if I go to the sides you can see that uh, the same texture is even applied to the sides also so let me just go here I'll turn down the divisions okay so as you can see here the same texture which is there on the top is also being applied onto the sides and uh, it doesn't really look good to have this shadow being applied on all the sides of the table at the same time because it's basically uh, using the UV coordinates and all the UV coordinates for this box are like overlapping with each other so I didn't want this to happen so for this reason I had to project this texture from the top so that it's being applied only from the top and not onto the sides so for that reason I took this cube and then I took a UV project node and projected using this camera so this camera is present here at the top you can see this camera is present at the top it's touching exactly the sides of the board so I just moved it so that it's touching exactly the sides and because a camera is projecting exactly on top of the board you can see that once I shift over to the UV project the texturing is changed and now the texture which is being projected is used and no longer the one which is being applied so this is a UV project node which is actually manipulating the UVs of the object so I can see this uh, all the black nodes which I have here I'll talk about why exactly they are black in a second let me talk a little bit more about the book itself so if you see the book texture you can see it's actually in 3D uh, the book texture the reason that it's in 3D is because the camera which I'm using which is here on to the side is actually looking at, looking at the object from a three-dimensional point of view so let me shift over to the camera so you can see this is the camera which I'm looking through at the book so what I did is because I'm using this camera for projection I took a screenshot of this itself or uh, basically I took the cube I scan line rendered it and I wrote out the UV snapshot of this output and then here within Photoshop I just took the simple snapshot which I uh, took by applying a checker, checkerboard onto the object and I created this additional checker, uh, texture on top of it so once this is done I went back into Nuke and use the same camera for projection the one which I used to take the snapshot I use the same camera to project this texture onto the cube so that now when the camera is looking through the object it's seeing exactly the same now if I just move the camera to the side you see the texture itself is sliding and it does not fit the object so this 
architecture is only valid as long as a camera which is being used is looking straight at the object from the same angle as the texture. So by using this method I was able to texture the book but there is a problem by with uh, using this method of texturing this is usually used for creating landscapes and such uh, the problem is that the region which is not seen the region behind the object has the entire texture smeared all, smeared all over it so you can see the same text is being smeared onto the sides and everything so uh, when you're trying to use projections like this make sure that you the camera which is projecting onto the object is going to uh, like m cover the maximum area uh, which is being uh, seen by the render cam so now once the cube is being uh, created or being set up I go went ahead and connected it into my scene and rendered it out the only other thing I have done in this scene uh, compared to the previous one is added a spotlight so that when I look through here you can see that there is some more detail onto the side of the book which is now visible which was no longer present when the light was not there so this is how the object looked like in the shadows beforehand when the spotlight was not there and now after adding the spotlight I have more details so it's always about making sure your objects have enough detail so now if I want I can also come into the spotlight and I can change the hue and get in the exact output which I'm looking for so let me decrease the blue and the green so the output has a bit more reddish tint into it and it adds in more look so this is how I created this output now let's take a look at what exactly these black nodes are let me start by unhiding all of my nodes so to begin with all the black nodes are what I like to refer to as helper nodes so these are the nodes which are actually helping me to create the composite uh, but they might not actually be necessary to create the final output anyway so uh, this is uh, not supposed to be black so let me just change the color a little bit so it's a slightly different and easier to see okay so all the black ones are the ones which uh, can be removed or deleted without any um, uh, uh, without bothering the composite on itself so first let's understand why exactly I've created these nodes here at the bottom to understand them uh, let's see why exactly um, we need them to begin with first I told you I created this shadow so that uh, the book uh, the, so it looks like the book is actually casting some shadows onto the table itself but to create this you can see that if I come back to the final output and open up my roto paint you can see the shape of the final output and the one which I have used do not match the reason they don't match is because whatever I have taken is being projected onto the object whereas the final ob uh, output is being looked through a different camera angle so for this purpose what I needed was a different view which basically tells me what I need to draw to get the right output or basically how what I need to draw to get this output so to create it what I first started doing is I created this merge geo node where basically I took two different objects both the table and the t uh, and the book and I combined them together in a single output so once I combined them I connected them to the scanline rendering so this scanline rendering is you making use of the projection cam which I have here to give me this output so this is actually what is being looked at or this is what the camera is actually seeing so once I have what the camera is seeing I wrote it out and read the image back in so when I have this image I just had to open my roto paint node and as you can see all I need to do is draw out the shape of the shadow which I wanted so once I drew out the shape which I wanted immediately that texture was created so that's all is required all I needed was a reference image and for that I created these additional nodes to just get that reference in the same way here at the bottom as you can see I needed the projection uh, which I need to put into the book itself so this projection so for that I created a scanline renderer and with, user, with the help of the scanline renderer uh, let me take a checkerboard here to just quickly display this so with the help of the scanline renderer what I did is take the camera uh, take the same camera as I'm using for the projection okay, this is the one and uh, take the screenshot of this write it out and use this in my Photoshop to create my final texture so that's how I got the book texture so as you can see the black nodes are the ones which are actually helping me to create the composite they're not actually necessary I can delete them once my final composite is done so this is how I created the projection texturing 
okay so finally this is the result that we are trying to obtain so as you can see we have a flyby of earth uh, there is a 3d moon and there is a 3d earth and there is a huge star field in the background so uh, to start creating this I'm going to st show you uh, what exactly is the process involved while creating something like this rather than uh, go and create the entire composite in the video itself so I've already gone ahead and I've created the final composite so as you can see this is the final composite the entire thing this is going to give you the result that we are looking for and here on the side this is the scene that we have for this output so as you can see we have this uh, outer sphere which is our star field so it has a texture mapped onto it and then we have uh, a camera which is moving through the shot so as you can see there's a camera there and also we have an earth at the center of our scene it has been textured and has been put in the center there and apart from the earth we also have the moon so uh, with these objects all you had to do is animate the camera add in some lights too of course so animate the camera and once that is done we have this going on so to get started uh, with this composite let's uh, first get go ahead and collect a few textures so the first texture I want is the earth and the moon so these textures can be obtained from this pixelplanetemporium.com uh, so uh, this website uh, has a load of images related to all the planets of our solar system so you can go ahead and download the textures which are required I have uh, just downloaded them and I have not actually changed any name so you know exactly which texture goes where so I've uh, actually been using the earth map, the bump map, specular, city lights, cloud map, cloud transparency and the moon uh, 1k resolution map. Uh, there's also a bump map which is here but I'm not actually used the bump map from here. So let's actually go ahead and uh, see how to get started. So here inside Nuke, uh, this composite I have just uh, gone ahead and created loads of backdrops and labels which you can see here. Each label tells what exactly is happening in that particular step so it's uh, easier for you to understand uh, what's happening in the composite when you go through the file. And also um, in this composite as you can see there are loads of things happening but one thing is uh, this uh, last section which exists the secondary glow on earth this uh, section I'm going to skip in the tutorial but it's um, I've made sure I have put in detailed notes about what exactly is going on so you can actually understand what's happening so what I'll be showing you right now is this section over here and uh, I'll show you what exactly I have done entirely to create the final output so let's get started here so to begin with first I have the earth map itself so as you can see there's an earth map I gotten from pixelplanetemporium.com and um, this earth map if you observe is not really that high res you can get the high res from the website itself you just had to pay a uh, little bit for that uh, whereas for this tutorial I didn't want to uh, so I have this very pixelated image and uh, it's quite uh, quite good uh, uh, it has a lot of details which I can use so I wanted to use this texture and go ahead and first add in some extra details like for example I have enough pixels here to actually add in some uh, uh, like um, additional information about the rivers and like just in increase the amount of detail which already exists so to do that what I uh, did is I went ahead and took the elevation map or the bump map so as you can see this is nothing but the elevation of the entire surface so as you can see the region near the Mount Everest is really high whereas the ocean and all okay the ocean is of course dark it doesn't have any mapping on it but as you can see all the mountain ranges are really high the rivers and oceans are completely low they're black so this is a map which I'm going to use to create some additional details I'm not going to use it as displacement or for shading I'm just going to fake everything into it so the first step of doing this is uh, I have my earth map and I have my earth bump now this earth bump as you can see has only a single channel in it so if I go ahead shift the channel to RGB red and shift it over to alpha you'll see that it's completely just uh, black and white uh, there is some problem with the image because of which it only loads uh, this part of it uh, so anyway 
Uh, as you can see the image is just a grayscale image of the earth's bump so what I have first done is taken this elevation map and I've actually added it into the alpha channel of the uh, color map which I'm getting in from here so all I have done is taken the RGB va RGBA values from this earth bump and shifted it to the alpha value whereas I'm using the default RGB so RGBA alpha RGB is coming in from here and the alpha is coming in from the earth bump so basically the channels have been shifted as you can see I've added in a label which exactly explains what I've done there so once that is done I've added in this embossed alpha uh, so this is a default node what it basically does is gives you an elevation map like a bump map um, so there are only few controls here so what I'm using is a traditional simple method of uh, creating this bump map uh, as you can see it created some elevated areas and some lowered areas so once I have this all I wanted to do was add it on top of my final image so basically I'm trying to fake my bump mapping so before I did that I just went ahead and sharpened it so as you can see there is this very slight difference so as you can see there is a very slight difference in the pixels they just be get sharpened up a little bit so I just added it in to get more of those so once it's sharpened I went ahead and merged it with hard light on so what basically hard light uh, blend mode does is that it takes the darkest values and it takes the lightest values and add those adds those on top whereas it ignores a anything which is 50% gray so basically if I come back to my uh, embossed map you can see this region which is here this region in the center it's almost close to 50% gray so it gets ignored whereas all the details which are going downwards like the shadows get added and all the details which are elevated get added so therefore hard light is the best one to use to get this detail so if you see the difference so this is the original uh, as you can see it looks kind of faded out and this one adds in a lot of details it uh, gives you uh, much uh, better quality uh, for uh, just by just adding the simple nodes so once I have that as you can already know I took this bump map and have added it into the alpha channel whereas I don't really want it in the alpha channel throughout because it might give me problems later down, later on in the composite so I went ahead and I added remove alpha and I removed the alpha channel alone so therefore this uh, last output which I have here does not have an alpha channel it's just a simple RGB output so if I go to the alpha you can see it's completely blank so this is the final earth image I have just simple processes just to increase the quality a little bit and add in some details like bump mapping so once this is done I went ahead and started working on the clouds so as you can see we have um, color map for the clouds and then we have a cloud transparency map which they have provided but one thing I noted uh, that nukes alpha value or the way the transparent map is being provided it's inverted so because of which I went ahead and inverted it so that nuke is able to understand how to use the alpha properly so once that is done I went ahead and shuffle copied it just the way I did before so this is the RGB channels and this is the alpha channel so I went ahead and applied the alpha channel itself so now if I come to the alpha channel you can see this is the alpha channel and then I have the RGB channels here uh, also another thing I have done here in the shuffle node is that I went ahead and removed the green and blue values which I had and I am only using the red values of the entire image so because of which the blue is automatically removed and my entire image is desaturated so this is a method I usually try and use uh, so that my entire image maintains the maximum brightness and it gives me the best results possible so once I had this I went ahead and pre multiplied the image so I get rid of the halfway alpha regions so as you can see there's the difference all the regions which have halfway alphas get pre multiplied and it gives me the best looking output so once I had this I went ahead and created the same emboss effect which I had over here so I went ahead applied emboss on top of this so this is the uh, kind of effect I got from it so as you can see it looks like the clouds are actually there floating on top so once I had that I went ahead and merged it on top so by doing this what I have is this result so if I come here to the top you can see the clouds look a bit more detailed so this is what I was looking for so once I had the cloud so as you can see I already had the alpha for this too so once I have the cloud all I needed to do was go ahead and merge these two together so when I merge them I have the earth itself with the cloud on top so uh, another thing I could have done here is actually merge the embos 
after the screening operation here so that the cloud actually casts shadows onto the earth that could also work so of course it's all up to you so once this is done as you can see if I come back to my alpha channel I will have I will uh, actually have my clouds alpha whereas I really don't want any alpha in the output at all so for that reason I went ahead and removed the alpha channel here with using this node and once it's done I went ahead and applied applied this entire image the final output which I have into my diffuse so now if I go look at the diffuse itself uh, I really can't see anything right now because I need the spear loaded in so this is the earth spear which I have Oops. So, uh, this is the earth which I have and as you can see this uh, earth automatically has the entire map applied. Uh, the quality is very low so let me just go ahead and increase the resolution of this. Uh, it's uh, better not to have a high resolution like this. It's better to work with low resolutions because your system would not hang or give you a lot of errors. So as you can see, there's a lot of detail, but there is one error, a problem with this mapping which you have, uh, which is with the clouds. As you can see, it does not repeat. It gives you the seam across the entire map and it doesn't really look very good. So I tried to kind of uh, work around this so that this region is not seen when uh, you see the final output. So I'm just trying to hide this entire region itself. So that was how I created the diffuse. Now next thing is I wanted to create the specular. So this is a specular map which was provided. So uh, what it basically tells is that where you have the water or wherever you have the ocean this is the region which is going to reflect the sun because land doesn't really reflect as much as water so when you look at earth from outer space it is a water which is reflecting so what I want is this region the red region in this image to be the reflective one so once I have this image all I had to do was go ahead and edit a few details so I've added a reformat node here I'll just come back to it in a second let's go into the shuffle node so as you can see what I've done here is uh, just went ahead done the same thing I had done before taken the R channel or the red channel and applied it to all the red green and blue channels so I'll basically have a black and white map of the entire specular channel so it basically looks like an alpha map and I can easily see what's going on so once I had this I went ahead and graded it so it's basically one fourth the brightness so you can see it's 1.5 here at the bottom so it's one fourth the brightness the reason I did this is because the earth's ocean is not like a flat ball or it's not a flat surface it has waves in it it has uh, storms raging on it so because of which there is some variation there will be like specks on top of the um, ocean itself so to get this kind of detail I went ahead and applied some noise so as you can see even the land right now has certain amount of noise applied so even this is going to give me some amount of speculum so of course a region like the Sahara Desert or uh, like the Himalayas they're not going to actually give you a lot of like specular highlights whereas the snow capped region of the Antarctic and the Iceland's now uh, that's going to give you a lot of speculum but right now uh, uh, really you can just go ahead and roto those in but I really don't want to go ahead and do all that next apart from this I went ahead and applied another noise map which gives me this loads of specular dots so as you can see it's a small amount of dots which has just been added in on top so now the reason that this reformat here is applied on the top is so that these dots which are applied are as small as possible so if I disable this you can see these dots are very really large and that will be, uh, give us um, like it will be easily seen and it will look fake because you can see the pixels so because I was adding this noise here at the bottom I just wanted it to be a higher quality so I just added in this reformat so that this noise is really small and you can't really see uh, the pixels in the later on so this basically in the end gives me the final specular map which I wanted so let's actually see the result of only the diffuse and specular individually so let me go to this output here which I have so as you can see we have the earth here I'll go to a frame where the earth is close enough okay so what I'm going to do is just uh, start disabling low a couple of these nodes so I'll disable the moon the star field so that the star field in the background is not rendered and let's go ahead disable this emission and 
disable the specular okay so from the top if I disable the clouds you can see this is the simple default earth that we get now with the clouds added on top this is the result that we are getting but of course the clouds cast shadow on top of earth so you can go ahead and actually multiply that on top but I really don't want to do that so once the clouds are added in next came the specular highlights so just to see the specular highlights in action I'm going to disable the clouds layer and enable the speculum so as you can see the specular has come in and you can see there are loads of these specs on top of earth and it basically makes it look much better uh, the reason for that is uh, every time you're trying to create a composite try to have details which are a few pixel levels to somewhere half range of the entire screen to the entire range so basically something which is very small like this something which is uh, a little bit bigger and then as big as possible so three levels of detail so that it looks much realistic so let me just add in the clouds so one problem here if uh, you have noted it is that the specular highlight is being actually added on top of clouds whereas clouds are not supposed to get any specular they're supposed to be underneath so you can actually go ahead take the cloud map merge them with the specular itself so that this cloud is cutting through the specular so it's all up to how much details you want now apart from this uh, if you know that uh, earth in the night time will actually have um, all the details like uh, for example city lights and uh, such things so basically we also have a map here which gives us the same thing so this is the city lights map so as you can see this is the map of earth in the night time so this is basically going telling us where exactly cities are and how the lights are lit up and what can be seen from outer space so this is exactly how earth looks like when it's in the night side so to get this output all i had to do was once my specular is combined i only had to apply the emission properties so if i come back to my final you'll see that here at down here on South Africa you can see that the specular is actually working this emission you can see these city lights are adding in some kind of detail so basically the entire night side of earth is not actually completely dark so it gives you these city lights and of course uh, if you see the city lights are actually adding some details everywhere else too you can go ahead create a mat if you want so that the light side does not actually get any mapping whereas it's not really necessary for this tutorial so once I applied this next step was to actually create the moon so for moon uh, of course I got the texture again from pixel planet Emporium and this is the texture it's a grayscale image of uh, moon itself and it's a spherical mapping which has to be applied on now first thing I did again is to use shuffle so that all the channels from red are get distributed and therefore I basically get something like this so it's a black and white map of moon itself so once I had this I went ahead and graded it so I just brightened it up because it was too dark and uh, um, moon because it's covered with a lot of dust is kind of amorphic so basically it doesn't give you a lot of specular highlights or anything as such so it's basically like a Lambertian ball so it just gives you a Lambert shader so therefore I just applied a diffuse on top and then had the final moon so let's go ahead and see the final output of moon here I'll go back to the front frames so this is the moon which you can see so as you can see it looks quite realistic uh, it's uh, no, the light is falling you can see that the shadows are aligned from the image itself so I don't need to align them and of course there is a dark side of the moon itself and to as you can see there is some lighting here even the dark side whereas earth had an emission map earth had this emission map of the cities whereas the moon doesn't have any emission map but still you can see the dark side the reason for that is because I've added in this fill lighting into the scene so there is not just a sunlight but there is also a fill light so it is because of this fill light that you can actually see the dark side of moon whereas it's not supposed to be so bright whereas I just added it in for the effect now I have the earth and the moon created and as you can see it's really fast the rendering is really fast you can see it's almost real time uh, of course it depends on your system configuration now once I had this all I had to do was fill in the background as you can as you already know the scanline uh, renderer already has this BG node to it so I can go ahead and take the BG node and apply it 
to the star field which I have so I can take it and apply it to the star field and immediately I get to see this result but of course if I have this when the camera is moving you'll see the background is static and it doesn't really look very realistic because uh, the, with a static background it doesn't actually look like the camera is moving it look like earth itself is moving so for that reason I actually wanted the background or the star field within the composite itself and for that reason I had to apply a star field spear so what this is basically this large spear which I have taken in so it's almost the covering the entire scene and once I had this spear covering the entire scene all I had to do was go ahead and map the texture file onto it so if I come in here so uh, with this star field all I had to do was go ahead and apply the texture onto the back of it so that when you look through the camera itself you'll see that the star field exists so uh, it's just a buffering problem because of which you can't see the background so as you can see this image is applied now one more thing that I've done with the star field here is if you if I just zoom out of it if you see here the image is not actually covering the entire section it's only covering a small portion of the spear the, this is the entire spear you can see only a small portion of it is covered and the way I did that was I just went ahead into the star field and here and over here you have the U and V extent and by default it is set to 360 180 because of which it wraps around the entire spear as you can see here whereas I went ahead and decreased it to a value where uh, basically the viewing angle of our camera so if you see here when I just play through the time slider we have our camera and it's not actually going out of this region at all so I didn't really want to go ahead and texture the entire region such that my camera is looking at anything else so when the camera is not looking at anything else there is no reason to texture that region so have a maximum resolution map possible only for that that region so I got that done so once this is completed all I had to do was make sure my lighting is correct so for my lighting I had my sunlight so as you can see it's a direct light I kept it at an angle to my camera so that uh, the earth or the moon both of them have some kind of shading going on on top of them so this direct light is just kept on to one side and I have named it Sun so it's easier to remember what it is and also when the object is not actually selected you can see there is the Sun name uh, like you can see it over here in the viewport itself it's called Sun so now the first thing is I made sure the color from the Sun itself is not completely red or white uh, I actually gave it a uh, little bit of an yellowish tint over here uh, it's harder to see but it's a kind of yellowish orange tint which is given it to the Sun now apart from that I made sure it's rotated and looking in the right direction next thing is I went ahead and increased the intensity from 1 to 1.2 so it's actually a bit brighter than it's supposed to be next I went ahead and created a fill light which is on the opposite side so it's not exactly perfectly opposite to the Sun itself it's just uh, like overlapping the Sun too so that this light has a very low intensity it's a 0 0.015 the reason for that is because the night side of Earth really does not get a lot of light the only light it gets is from the moon the majority of the light and the rest of the light is from the stars and it's not much to actually illuminate it compared to the Sun so this is just there for adding in a bit of detail in the darker regions so what I have done here is basically created the earth's color and bump I basically added in all the details I added the clouds together over here and then add in the specular maps once it's done I had my final earth and once my earth is completed I went ahead created moon as you can see moon was a very simple thing here then I created my stars and put them all into the same scene so in the scene I have a Sun and a light now the next step of the process was to actually create the camera animation so as you can see here the camera has this animation where it goes from behind the moon and it actually travels through passing through them so 
to create this animation the way I did it is first I took this axis now as you can see so this is the axis node which I have and as you can see it has a path and it's moving from here to the towards earth and if I play through you'll see it has a very smooth motion for it so here you can see it has a few keyframes here at the bottom and if I open my curve editor you'll see that all the curves are as smooth as I could make them to get the best output now uh, there are a few main things that I took care of while creating it so the movement is kind of dynamic so first thing I made sure that the object is like always moving at the same speed and next thing is in the beginning you can see the entire crosses are aligned um, from the bottom left to the top right whereas in the end of the composite you will see that it's reversed from the top left to the bottom right so it basically adds in like a fly through feel so once I created this I had this camera here at the origin itself so I just connected the input from the camera to the axis so that the camera is actually moving according to the axis so basically what I can do is layer one axis on top of another one taking care of movement one taking care of rotation so you can just layer one animation on top of another to create the final output so this axis went ahead and gave me this motion and uh, to actually look at what exactly is happening in here let me just go in and connect in my scene so with this scene selected I can go on turn on my camera lock so I'll go ahead and select my cam so this is the camera I'm looking through and by playing through you'll see this is the results so uh, this is the kind of output which I'm looking at I know exactly what I'm going to get now the thing is to add in something extra so to just see how exactly it would look like in the end I can go ahead and create my scanline rendering node here at the bottom so this is the final output which you can see and you can see it's quite high quality you can see a lot of details even if I come forward you can see there is a lot of details but as soon as the earth comes too close you can see that you can actually make out the pixels in the clouds you can actually make out the pixels on earth itself so I really did not want it to be like that so for that reason what I went and, uh, did is uh, I added in some motion blur and to add motion blur all you need to do is go into your scanline rendering and this is a way of adding in actual motion blur not fake motion blur so where you can do it is go into multi sample in your scanline renderer and change the sample rate to something higher so let's say I give in a sample rate of 2 and immediately you can see the entire image gets blurred but you can see that there are, there is immediately two duplicates of the same image basically it's being sampled twice so to get in a better output I can go ahead and increase the sample to let's say something like 6 so it gives me a smoother result of course it does not work if there is a lot of motion blur because in, that, in such a case it will give you 6 different dots so let's just look at these stars for example you can see that it can easily be made out that these are nothing but dots so for that reason you can't really use it as much as uh, you want because all the sharp edges will give you those uh, cut, uh, cutting looks so uh, you would have to increase this value to a higher extent so let's say around 30 or 40 to get the best looking output whereas I did not really want to spend so much time behind creating motion blur I just wanted it to look good enough so for that reason I left the samples at 1 and instead what I did is whatever output I'm getting here actually has uh, actually if you see here this output itself if I go into my motion channel and move my mouse around you can see that here at the bottom that there is some values present here so let me just go ahead and uh, change the values here let's see if I can increase it okay let me see okay so as you can see there is some values present in here 
and these values are basically motion vectors it's telling the computer how exactly the object itself is moving so when I have these values all I need to do is tell uh, the computer to blur the image according to the movement of the pixels so what I've done here is I've taken this node which is known as a vector blur so let me just disable this other node so this is known as a vector blur and what I've done is just enabled it so what it does is gives me this additional motion blur in the background so as you can see it added in this motion blur just by the use of uh, the way the pixels are moving within my final image itself so as you can see having this kind of ability to add in motion blur at a later time is a very big advantage so once it is done I added in a couple of grade notes to do some color corrections bring out a couple of lights and then I wrote out the final image so I'll go into what exactly I did here in a little bit more in, uh, detail in a few minutes before that uh, let's actually look at these stars itself and before I do let me go ahead and increase the amount of motion blur so I'll just let's say take it to 10 so as you can see when there is a lot of motion blur uh, these stars they kind of start losing their luster they kind of go from white to something which is a bit darker so here when I take the multiply value to let's say around 80 you'll see that it's no longer white it, they turn out gray whereas if you see uh, when you take some pictures or when you t use your camera and you turn on the sh when you leave on the shutter for a very long time light doesn't give you these streaks light gives you some very crisp bright streaks so this is kind of wrong it's not giving the exact output which we are which we need so basically to get the right output what I did is I went into the star field as you can see there is a grade node applied to the star field within this grade node what I've done is just decrease the gamma a little bit and then the next step is in the emission node itself as you can see the emission is not set to 1 but it's set to 4 the reason for that is when I set it to a value higher than 1 it actually gives me float point values so let's actually see that result first so this is before the motion blur applied and I'll take the emission value to back to 1 so as you can see the entire background is darkened and if I come to the brightest spot you can see the maximum value here at the bottom is actually 1 so now if I take the emission value to 4 the brightest value is actually 4 so the reason this gamma node is being applied here is because this gamma takes the brightness and decreases it uh, just a little bit so that this increase is compensated by decreasing the gamma here so let me just go ahead and decrease the gamma a little bit more so it's a little darker and I'll take the emission to let's say something around 10 so when I go here to the brightest points you can see the value here is giving telling me that the brightest point is actually 10 in number and now if I come back to my vector blur you can see that the lights have a bit more intensity to them they are not as uh, dark as they used to be if I go ahead and take the emission down you can see that they are darker whereas when you apply motion blur to bright lights they're not supposed to be like this so by taking this value to a higher level I was actually able to get something which is a bit more realistic in the real world so this is the reason I apply the grade node and try to get as realistic a motion blur as possible and of course when you're applying vector blur never blur it to this extent because of course the result will be really bad so as you can see at a lower level these light streaks look really good they have this real smooth value to them so let me just go ahead and decrease the value back to 1 which is the default so you have these very bright specks of light which have slight motion blur applied and they look really good so I'll take back my emission down and uh, increase my gamma back to 1.9 so I can see all the details so if I just wanted the nebula to be a bit darker I can just go ahead and take it down a little bit just depends on what exactly what look you're going for so uh, that is one thing I took care of 
to get proper motion blur realistic motion blur you can also do the same thing on earth because the light which is falling on earth is from the sun so basically you're supposed to have a very bright highlight whereas I've just faked it uh, it's supposed to look good on cinema not the real one so I just made sure it looks good here now the next thing I've done here is actually add in some kind of glow onto the planet so if you see here I have some kind of a glow applied on earth and as you can see it's brighter when it's facing the sun rather than when it's not facing the sun whereas uh, when it's in the darker region so the way this is done is with the help of all these nodes here on the side I'm not going to go too deep into these details whereas I'm just going to give you an overall view about what exactly is happening in here so let me go ahead and disable this so this is the output which you are looking at and this is the brightness which we have so what I first did is of course we know that our scene is being rendered over here whereas I also added a new scanline renderer here at the top and what this scanline rendering is doing is basically give me the render of earth so when it's giving me the render of earth I'm making sure that it's giving me more than what I want so if I see this render here You can see here that it's telling me it's uh, 1280, 720 here at the top. It's a simple HD footage. Uh, actually, the final resolution is 1980, uh, sorry, 1920, 1080 uh, full HD. Whereas this output, which I'm rendering here on the side, is telling me that it is minus 20 pixels extra here on the sides. So the reason it's telling me that it's minus 20 extra is because in the scanline renderer you can see that it's over scanning by 20 pixels so I'll tell you why that is required now once I have the scanline rendering I went ahead and shuffled the notes so that I have my alpha channel set into my RGB and then I set it edge detect so basically what edge detect does is it takes in the alpha channel and sees where exactly the edges of the object are so if I go to my alpha channel you can see I basically have an outline now once I have the outline all I had to do is go ahead and dilate this outline so basically I'm thickening or thinning the outline and then I again went ahead and shuffled the alpha channel into RGB the reason there are two shuffles is because the first shuffle is basically telling how the edge detect should work and once the edge detect has worked I'm shifting back the alpha channel again into RGB so I have made sure I put in some annotations here on the side so you can understand what's happening so next step was to apply some blur so I blurred only the inside edge of the earth so I'm using the mask which I got in from earth itself the alpha mask and I've applied it to bl blur over here on the edge and I'm just trying to blur out the image itself so once I have that one blurred I graded it so it's a bit darker so it's the inside region and then I blurred the outer region so it's going outward and then blurred both of them so there is no sharp edge okay so there is this sharp edge on the uh, corner and I did not want it because it will give you a problem with motion blur and I did not want to go ahead and correct that so of course you can get rid of this error if you pre multiply the alpha and all but I really don't want to confuse you with that so next after this is done I graded it so that it has perfect white and black values and then graded it once more so that it has this blue color of course I could have used a single grade to do this but I just wanted to be clear about what's happening instead of doing all of it in once next once this is done of course I wanted it to glow when the sun is there and not glow when the sun is not there so I wanted some kind of control over that so for this I went ahead and took this blur I blurred the actual image of earth which I'm getting in from the renderer itself and I graded it so it's completely bright and as you can see the shadow region is being cut off because uh, because oh, basically I'm blurred it and the shadow region is gone and because of the grading it's too dark to be seen so now I'm just shuffling some nodes so that basically the dark region is the region with the sun falling on it is bright and the other region is dark and now I'm just multiplying it on top so that the region where the sun's falling is brighter than the one where it's not so this is what I had and this is what I have simple alteration now the reason I had this overscan turned on here at the top is because if the overscan is turned off this kind of edges are, is going to give you a problem so let's just go to the point where earth is just touching the corner ok 
okay next frame okay so as you can see it's giving you some kind of an error there is a dip here at the edge the reason this dip exists is because when you're rendering you're rendering only this final image right you're rendering only the final image and you can't actually see what's happening beyond so the computer doesn't actually know that there is supposed to be an edge so when it did all of this and created the edge it doesn't have anything over here at the bottom because of which when we have done all this blurring and created the final output it's giving us this dip so what I did is went ahead in the scan line and I over scanned the image itself so by giving zero over scan I'm going to have the image cut off here at the edges whereas it will definitely look bad because it look like some kind of a camera effect so for this region I went ahead and over scanned it to a large degree so that I actually have an image even though there is nothing seen over there so as you can see it looks much better now because it's being over scanned and all the details exist so now even if I go beyond you can see the details over there are still existent and all of it as well so as you can see this is the amount of extra pixels you have of course I don't really need that much so I'll just decrease it let's say 30 or probably even 20 so once I have this output all I had to do is go ahead and screen it on top so I have one region which is giving me this highlight uh, the final uh, glow on earth and another one which is giving me earth itself and as uh, because I'm using the same alpha channel as the earth itself it's exactly aligned so all I went uh, did is screened it on top and immediately it gives me a much better looking earth and I went ahead and applied motion blur on top of it because as you can see there is a lot of pixelation and once I apply motion blur this pixelation is reduced a bit because the motion blur just blurs the image and gets rid of a lot of the details of course uh, you only need slight motion blur uh, my um, example which I have created here is very short so there is a lot of fast movement so of course there is a lot of motion blur and as you can see lots of details which I have added are actually being ignored now so just um, do it in a way which uh, you feel is right where whichever you feel would give you the best output now uh, last thing which I would like to do uh, is um, when the camera is flying through I just want to have some kind of an asteroid or something right in the middle of the scene itself so let me go ahead and disable this vector blur because it takes a lot of time to calculate and I'll go ahead and shift over to the 3d view and turn off my camera lock so that I'm actually looking at my scene so uh, to create the asteroid as you can see the earth and moon are quite far apart and the camera moves through them so I'm going to create an asteroid somewhere in between them so to create the asteroid I'm going to go ahead and duplicate the moon the reason I'm duplicating the moon is because it's the easiest way of creating the asteroid directly so let's see the moon the reason this moon looks kind of um, half gone is because the alpha channel exists in here so I'm going to make sure the output has only RGB in it so as you can see immediately there is no alpha and the moon looks much better next thing I'm going to do is go ahead into the moon properties and increase the rows and columns and if you have observed through the video the rows and columns on earth are actually larger or more than the than on moon because it is the largest sphere and I did not want it to have a bad silhouette so uh, let me just go ahead and actually increase it to let's say 100 so it has a lot of detail and next thing I'm going to do is uh, apply a modifier on this so let's go ahead and uh, 3d I'm going to modify and I'm going to tell I want it to have displaced geo applied so I'm going to take this moon and apply a displacement and the displacement I'm going to apply is going to come in from this grade node so as you can see immediately that grade node is taking care of some displacements so I can go ahead I'll go ahead to pixelplantemporium.com I'll take in the bump texture which I had for moon itself so that I can use that to displace the moon texture so I've just bought in the moon bump image so as you can see there's the bump map which has been provided all the craters and everything are dark in values and the elevations are bright in values so if I just apply to my displaced geo and just look at the output you can see that it's working well the only problem is the top ends and the bottom end are kind of being pinched so if you want a good output you might probably want to do this in Maya rather than in Nuke because the pinching is happening because of the UVs 
so uh, one thing one thing you can do is just uh, turn, toggle this close top and close bottom on and off so that the pinching is kind of reduced I'm not sure why exactly it works but it kind of works so now with the displaced geo I can go ahead scale this values till I get something which looks okay and also to actually add in some extra details or basically to create a rougher surface I can go ahead apply different kinds of modifiers like for example I can tell uh, let's say another displaced geo on top of this and for this displaced geo what I'll do is take a constant let's say it's completely black and I'll apply noise on top of this okay so this noise is going to be my displacement map as you can see immediately it starts creating some details of course the map which we have just created does not repeat so as you can see it's not something which repeats from both sides so because of which you will have a seam in your object so take care of how exactly you can work with it now once that is done I can go ahead scale it up or down and try to get an output as best as possible so I guess the best thing to do here would be to disconnect it and place it actually before the final pipe so it's being displaced first and then something is being applied so we have something which looks very uh, awkward right now of course if we place it in the right way uh, and the camera looks at only one region then you can't really make out that it's really so low res or anything as such so let me just go ahead and increase the resolution my nuke just crashed on me so anyway I have this asteroid and uh, it's been created you can see it has a lot of details on it so what I need to do is just place it in the path of the camera so that when it's moving it can actually go through this and uh, give us a different looking output so I'm just going to go ahead and take a output from here connect it in there just let's go connect it back in there so now if I go back to my scene you can see the first thing is uh, this object is actually being positioned exactly in the same place as our moon right now so what I'll do is go ahead and transform this so to transform it all I need to do is apply a transform okay sorry about that it needs to be transformed 3d okay so I applied a transform node and now with the transform node you can see the handles are provided here at the center I'm just going to go ahead and move it so that it's in the way of the camera when it's moving so let me just lock into the cam just trying to position it such that it uh, gives me a better looking output of course I can go ahead to the moon file I can zero out these values so the moon is exactly where it's supposed to be and let's say here in the end it's actually supposed to come on screen so I'm just working with the screen space So I'm just trying to rotate it so that you can't really see any of the seams and it looks okay. I'm just going to scale it up a little bit or down. Okay, so I just kept in the geometry over there and if I go back to my scanline renderer and shift over to 2D, you'll see that immediately I have a 3D object set in there so of course you can go ahead uh, bring in a 3d object from let's say of course uh, don't bring in very high resolution meshes because your nuke will crash it is an awesome software but of course it will still crash so you can go ahead sculpt in your geometry in zbrush of course and bring in some really detailed geo and try to work with it so anyway so this is what I wanted to show you today there's an entire 3d introduction to nuke so we saw how to create simple objects texture them 
we saw how to create the simple texture and then we saw how exactly you can go ahead and transform objects we saw also how exactly we can go ahead and texture and shade our objects we saw how to apply our diffuse specular highlights and all such things uh, I showed you how to ap apply emission maps and then also I went ahead and showed you how to use UV project so that you project your textures onto your objects and then of course I went ahead and showed you a much more uh, interesting composite where I went ahead and created this composite with shadows and everything connected. Uh, this one is not working as of now because of the resolution. Uh, if the resolution is set right, it will start working again. Uh, of course, I really don't want to go into it right now. So anyway, in the end, uh, I showed you how to create this final earth composite. And in the end, we also added in that asteroid right next to earth so probably this is going to be Armageddon okay so uh, this is a way you can work with Nuke in 3D so you create objects or you bring in some objects and you uh, create a composite like this put in some lights and you have a working model which you can render out now the last thing which I've shown you is how exactly you can apply motion blur to get the output and also another way to get it is using the multi sample and let's see what exactly is remaining in 3D okay the final thing the one thing I've missed out is how exactly would you bring in objects or render out objects or export objects from Nuke itself so to do that all you need to do is go into your 3D and let me just do that here if you go into your 3D under geometry you have read geo and write geo and exactly the way you have read and write nodes in Nuke read geo brings in 3D geometry FBX files or your OBJ files and write geo writes them out so this is the way you import and export 3D objects so that is there and of course you can go ahead use Python script in anything you want script in some shaders or anything you want and last thing I would like to mention if uh, you are, are using one of the latest versions of nuke uh, it um, under lights already you have a shadow tab and uh, by default you can just click on a check mark and you automatically have shadows you don't actually have to go ahead and create shadows the way I did in this previous composite so I really hope you understood this tutorial I know this was a long one it almost ran for two hours uh, but I really hope you understood something out of it uh, all the files that I've used the ones uh, that I can give will be provided on the description and those of which you can download off the internet I'm going to provide you a link to them so for now uh, this is all there is in the video if you have any doubts put them in the comments and any feedback would always be welcome so for this video that's all there is I'll see you in the next one